Do you have a pretty good grasp of the consonants that make up the alphabet in biblical Hebrew? And do you have a pretty good grasp of the vowels and markings uh, that make that make up the nekudot in biblical Hebrew? If, if you do, and if you'd like to learn how to start putting those consonant and vowel sounds together, then this episode of The Apologetics is for you. This is Chris Date, and welcome to The Apologetics, where every other week I discuss a wide variety of theological issues and show how a properly biblical worldview can help defend the historic Christian faith from its critics. Join me as we think through what we believe and why we believe it, and not something else. All right, so if you haven't already watched the first two lectures in this series, Biblical Hebrew 101, and if you don't already have a decent grasp of the consonants and vowels that make up the, uh, the, the words in Biblical Hebrew, then I would encourage you to go watch those first two uh, lectures. The, the first of those lectures covered what's called the Hebrew Aleph Bet, the uh, consonants that make up the alphabet uh, for, used in Biblical Hebrew. And then the second lecture covered the vowel sounds and some other markings uh, that, that, um, that are decorated around the consonants in Biblical Hebrew to help you pronounce them. Um, so make sure you've either watched those lectures or have a good grasp on the Biblical Hebrew consonants and vowels before you proceed with this lecture. In this lecture we're going to start putting those things together uh, and making nouns. Now, as I said I would do in each lecture within this series, I want to start with a bit of a warm-up to, to help get our minds uh, ready to learn Biblical Hebrew. And uh, as you'll recall, if you've watched those previous two lectures, I'd like to introduce you to a, uh, a word or phrase that you can use in conversational Hebrew today and to some sort of biblical word that um, is transliterated in many of our Bibles rather than translated so that you know when you see it what it is that you're seeing, what it is that it means. So today we're going to cover how to give, uh, how to tell someone thank you in modern conversational Hebrew, and we'll look at the uh, the word that sometimes appears in our Bibles as sabaoth. All right. So first of all, in modern contemporary conversational Hebrew, if you want to say tell somebody thanks, then you can simply say toda, toda. All right. That means it's just a simple informal way of, way of saying thank you, in the same way that in English you might say thanks. Now, if you want to say something a little bit more um, formal or a little bit more, um, you know, you, you want to emphasize, look, thank you very much and not just thanks, then you could say toda raba. Toda raba. Right? So, thanks, you can just say toda. And thanks very much, you can say toda raba. All right, and there are other ways to say thanks, and indeed other ways to say many of the things that you'll learn in the course of this lecture series, but uh, this is something you can immediately start using out of the gate if you have uh, Hebrew speakers that you know. Um, maybe you can impress them a little bit by telling them thanks next time they do something for you by saying toda or toda raba. Now, in terms of a biblical name, word, or expression that appears in our English Bibles often as transliterated rather than as translated, um, what we're going to learn this time in our warm-up is the word sabaoth. All right, in Hebrew, this is the plural form of a word that I think you're going to learn in the vocabulary of this lecture. If not, then at the end of the next lecture. Uh, the plural is tzvaot, and it means hosts or armies. And this very often appears after uh, the name of God. So when you see, you'll often see something like Lord of Hosts. And what that means is God of Armies, right? Master of Armies. And very often the armies in mind are the angelic host, the angelic armies. Um, this word, Savaot, is in some translations, um, it, 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 is, uh, it appears in the New Testament as well in some translations, specifically Romans 9.29 and James 5.4, because in those two places, the author uses a Greek transliteration of the Hebrew tzvaot. You can see the, or the, the Greek transliteration right there on your screen, sabaoth, um, which isn't a translation of tzvaot, it's a transliteration, and it means the same thing, hosts or armies. 
Um, and in some translations, it comes across as Sabaoth rather than as hosts or armies. So if in an English translation, you come across the word Sabaoth, now you know what it means. It doesn't mean Sabbath or, or anything like that. It's the plural form of army or host. Um, and typically is used to describe God as the Lord of hosts, Lord of armies. All right. So with that, hopefully um, helpful warm up out of the way, let's dig into how to put consonants and vowels together to make nouns. And in the course of this, we will also discuss what it means to parse and inflect nouns. Um, the terminology of parsing and inflection is something that you'll want to start to grasp if you haven't already. Now, to begin with, languages can be thought of as being somewhere on a spectrum from very analytic at one end to very synthetic at the other end. You'll sometimes hear of analytic versus synthetic languages, but it would actually be probably more accurate to speak of more synthetic versus less synthetic and more analytic versus less analytic languages. This isn't a, a binary on or off. It's not an either or, it's a spectrum, all right? and. Um, languages considered to be very analytic prefer to convey relationships between words using helper words and word order, all right? Um, by contrast, however, synthetic languages prefer to convey these kinds of relationships by embedding them in the very forms of the words themselves. And I'm going to give you an example of this in a moment. And um, English is generally considered to be a fairly analytic language. Again, that's a language that prefers to, prefers to communicate these relationships between words using helper words and word order. But Hebrew is a much more synthetic language. It prefers to communicate those kinds of relationships by modifying the forms of words and putting pieces of words together as I will demonstrate for you in a moment. What, all of this is to say that if you are a native English speaker, there is going to be a bit of a learning curve adapting to Hebrew because of this transition from very analytic to very synthetic. All right, so keep that in mind and, and just be prepared for a bit of a learning curve, but it does start to become fairly natural, so don't get too nervous about it at this point in your, in your progress. Now to help illustrate the, the, the analytic nature of English versus the synthetic nature of Hebrew, um, we could take a look at this sentence from 2 Samuel 1.15. The sentence in English is, and he struck him down so that he died. All right, so you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine words, each comprised of anywhere from two to six letters, all right? Um, but you can see how, um, uh, how a relatively simple and straightforward sentence might appear in English. That whole translation translates this in Hebrew. Vayakehu, vayakehu, vayamot. All right. So here's how this analytic versus synthetic relation or, or uh, difference is um, exhibited in these two respective languages. The word and in English is a word all of itself, all by its own, but it's a consonant and vowel prefixed to the beginning of the first word in these two Hebrew words. The phrase, he struck him down in English is all one particular, one simple verb in the Hebrew uh, to which that um, first consonant was prefixed to communicate and. So four words, he struck him down, are all communicated by this one um, form of this one verb. The, phrase, the English phrase, so that, is again uh, reflected in a single Hebrew consonant and a vowel prefixed to the next verb. And then the phrase, he died, in English, is communicated by that one form of that one, ver the second verb in that Hebrew phrase. So all of these um, features that take one or multiple words to communicate in um, in a total of what I said, I think was nine, uh, nine English words, each comprised of two to six characters. All of that is communicated in two relatively short Hebrew words. And what this tells you is that as a synthetic language, Hebrew packs a whole lot of information into a single word uh, compared to an analytic, analytic language like English. Now, Nouns in any given language. In case you're, um, in case you're not not exactly sure what a noun is, it's it's very often just a person, place, or thing, an object. 
Um, and there are specialized kinds of nouns. There are what are called pronouns, I, you, we, they. Um, we'll learn about these in future lectures. There are proper nouns, which are the names of persons and places. Uh, but when we talk about nouns in general, we're talking about things like chair, rock, person, you know, something like that, a thing, a person, place, or thing. And in any given language, nouns can be described with a number of grammatical characteristics or properties. In English, for example, nouns have three such characteristics. Gender, um, and this can be masculine, feminine, or neutral. So for example, he is masculine, she is feminine, but then many, or if not the vast majority of English words are neutral. There is no gender in the word computer, for example. Then there's number, which can be either singular or plural. So you can have computer or computers. You can have goose or you can have geese. You can have moose or you can have moose, because <laughs> I think moose is plural of moose. And then there's case, um, and case is nominative, which is the, the um, function of a word that is the subject of a sentence. Oblique, which is when it's the object of a preposition or the object of a sentence. And then genitive, which is uh, the possessive. So they would be the um, nominative case of the word they, you know, they are are the subject of a sentence, so they went to the store. Oblique would be the object of a preposition or the object of a sentence, so they went to the store. Store is the, um, or, or let me let me say it this way, the same word they, if it's the object of a sentence, like he gave it to them, the word them is in that oblique or objective case. But then there's also their, T-H-E-I-R, the thing that belongs to them, their. Right, that's a genitive case. So you can see how at least some English words do have these different cases, although that's not normal. Most English words do not have uh, differences between these cases. Um, but a few do. So you can still see that even there is still a little bit of a synthetic nature to English, at least in some cases. All right, so some, some, a few, a small handful of English words. But for the most part, English is very analytic. Now, to parse, the word parse, when referring to a noun, means to list these characteristics usually in a standard or prescribed order. So, um, if we have the word father, for example, in English, we would, if we were asked to parse it, we would say that its gender is masculine, right? You wouldn't use the word father to describe a female. Um, it is singular, right? If it were plural, it would be fathers, but this is just father, so that's uh, singular. And its case is either going to be nominative or oblique. It's either going to be the subject of a sentence or the object of a sentence or the object of a preposition. All right. So you could say my father went to the store. Right. That would be um, uh, nominative. Or you could say I gave my gift. I gave a gift to my father. Then father is oblique. But it's the same either way, whether it's a subject or the object. So we parse father, the word father, by saying it's masculine, singular, and either nominative or oblique. The word mothers, by contrast, is feminine. You wouldn't use the word mother to refer to a male, at least uh, historically. Nowadays, everything's kind of up in the air. It is also singular, right? You're only referring to a single mother and not to many. But now the case, as reflected in that apostrophe S, is genitive or possessive. Right. If I am referring to my mother's pen, if I said my mother's pen is uh, writes beautifully, right? Um, my is possessive, and so is mother's, right? Because I'm referring to my mother, but then I'm also referring to my mother's pen. So pen is the subject of the sentence, but mother's is the genitive using used to identify whose pen it is. All right. So. Mothers, if we asked to parse that English word, we would say it's feminine singular genitive. And then finally, the word we is technically a pronoun, not a simple noun, but it's for the sake of illustrating what it means to parse a noun. The word we in English is gender neutral, right? It doesn't refer either to specifically male or specifically female persons. It's plural, right? It's the plural form of I. And it's nominative, and it's not oblique. You wouldn't say they gave the they gave their gifts to we, right? You wouldn't say we as the object of that sentence. You would only say us. So we is the subjective form only 
of this word, not the object of one. So it's just a nominative. There is no alternative oblique case. So these are three examples of what it means to parse nouns in English. And you'll see that you do something similar when parsing Hebrew shortly. So that's what it means to parse. To inflect a noun is to change its form from whatever characteristics it currently represents to a form that expresses a different particular set of characteristics. So let's say that we're starting with a singular nominative word child in English. If asked to inflect it to make it plural nominative, so it's still the subject of a sentence, but now it's plural, instead of child, we would say children. If we wanted to make it singular still, but genitive now, we would put an apostrophe S and make it children's. And if we wanna make it plural, but we want to make it oblique, well, it's going to look the same as the, in the nominative because we use children, um, whether it's the subject or the object of a sentence. Now, if asked to inflect the word I to make it plural nominative, we would simply change it to we. We just discussed that on the last slide. If we were asked to inflect the word I to make it singular and genitive, well, it's already singular, but now we need to make it possessive or genitive, so we would make it my. And if asked to inflect the word I to make it plural and oblique, then we would say, we would, we would inflect it by changing its form to us, right? It's plural and it's the object of a sentence or, or, um, or preposition. So it would be us, not we. And then finally, if asked to inflect the word it and make it plural nominative, we would change its form to they. If asked to inflect the word it to make it singular genitive, then we would make it, we would, we would change its form to its without a, an apostrophe, because in, if you're not aware, it with an, it's, it's with an apostrophe is short for it is. The possessive or genitive form of it is its with no uh, apostrophe. And if asked to inflect the word it to make it plural and oblique or objective, then we would change it to them. So these are nine different ways, uh, th three ways to inflect each of three singular nominative nouns in English. And again, you'll see that uh, inflecting Hebrew nouns is, is quite similar. All right, so we've sort of introduced nouns, parsing and inflection in English or using English as an illustration. Now let's apply it to Hebrew, all right? Hebrew nouns have three characteristics uh, two of which are the same as in English. First is gen gender, um, but in Hebrew, gender is either masculine or feminine. Uh, there is no neuter, although there are some nouns that are both masculine and feminine, which is pretty much the same as saying it's neuter. Um, there's also number, and this is again the same as English in that they're singular and plural, except that Hebrew has a third kind of number called dual, and you'll learn about that. But instead of case, which is something that English exhibits, and, and for those of you that might have studied some Greek, it's also something that Greek, it's a characteristic of Greek nouns. Instead of case, Hebrew uh, nouns have state. And the state of a Hebrew noun is either absolute or construct. This is not something that you, a, a difference that you will learn in this lecture, but I'm introducing it now because it's part of what it means to parse and inflect nouns. Um, you will learn more about this in a future lecture. But let's break each of these down individually. First, gender. Hebrew nouns are, are masculine, feminine, or both. A word's grammatical gender is often the same as the natural gender of the thing the word represents, but not always. So when I'm talking about grammatic, grammatical gender, I'm talking about its gender in terms of grammar, but not in terms of like reality. Right, so it's the it's the gender that informs how the noun is inflected, and 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 what the form of related words need to be in the same sentence. But I'm not necessarily talking about the gender of that thing in reality. So, for example, in Hebrew, the word bain means son, and the feminine noun bat means daughter. Those are uh, grammatically masculine and feminine respectively, and they correspond to the gender of the object that that word represents, right? A, a son is in fact masculine or male, and a, and a daughter is in fact feminine or female. So in this case, the grammatical gender corresponds to the natural gender. But the word brit means covenant, and it doesn't, and it's grammatically feminine, but a, a covenant doesn't have a gender in reality. 
And similarly, the word dam means blood. And grammatically, it's masculine, but blood in reality is neither masculine nor feminine. So you can see that grammatical gender and natural gender sometimes correspond. You might even say often correspond, but not always. So just remember, when we talk about the gender of Hebrew nouns, we're talking primarily about its grammatical gender, not the gender of the thing the word represents. Secondly, number. Hebrew nouns are singular, dual or plural. Dual means two. I mean, that seems fairly obvious, but it's important to remember that plural nouns often refer to two also. So for example, in Genesis 1.16, the two great lights. In that phrase, the word lights is plural, not dual. Dual, you see, as a, as a um, number, is reserved for a few different things. Natural pairs, like hands, and for certain expressions of time and measure. And these are going to be something you learn mostly through vocabulary. And sometimes you'll be able to identify it by the form the noun appears in. Um, so just remember that plural often is used to refer to two things. The dual form is usually reserved for these natural pairs and certain expressions of time and measure. Now, importantly, even if a noun is singular, it can refer collectively to a group, right? So, for example, the word am, you will learn, means people, but not people as in many persons, like the plural of the word person. Rather, people in, this, in the way I might say, um, Americans are a freedom-cherishing people, right? Um, I'm referring to a people. So it's singular, but it's referring collectively to a group. You're going to find that sometimes that is how singular nouns function in biblical Hebrew as well. And then also some singular nouns, nouns that are singular grammatically, nevertheless have a dual or plural form. So if you just look at the form, you might be tempted to think that it's actually plural or, or, or dual, but in reality it is singular and other related noun, other related words in a sentence um, will give that away. Um, so just be aware that although we do have, although biblical Hebrew nouns are singular, dual, or plural, um, sometimes a singular noun can refer to more than one, either because it's referring collectively to a group or because... Um, Oh, because it refers to collective group, and sometimes a singular noun may have a dual or plural form. And then lastly, like I said, remember that plural can refer to two. It's the, the dual is for specific circumstances. Now finally, state. Hebrew nouns are either absolute or construct. The absolute state is the default ordinary state of a noun. It's the kind it's the state of a noun that we're going to be working with for quite some time and um all throughout this lecture. Construct state nouns are, are kind of like possessives. So for example, in Genesis 1-2, surface of the deep. In that phrase, surface of, is the word surface, but in the construct state, right? Um, if you know any biblical Greek, you might know that um, it has a case that communicates this kind of relationship called genitive. Um, in the phrase son of God, the underlying Greek is something like hahuyas tu theu, right? Hahuyas is son, and then of God is the word theos, but inflected to be theu, meaning of God. So, Son is nominative case, who th uh, theu is genitive case, son of God. Hebrew does it a little bit backwards uh, in one way of speaking. Instead of son of, instead of having son and then of God, Hebrew will have son of and then God, right? And son of is kind of like the construct state that we're talking about right here. But don't worry about that for now. Construct state is something that we'll be teaching in a future lecture. For now, we'll only be working with the absolute state. So for the sake, you know, for the time being, just assume that all the nouns that we're dealing with are in the absolute state. Again, the reason I'm mentioning this now is that you get into the habit right off the bat when asked to parse a noun of providing the three things that you need to provide, gender, number, and state. 
All right, now the form in which a Hebrew noun appears in the dictionary is called its lexical form. Uh, the reason it's called its lexical form is because a Hebrew dictionary is called a lexicon. Also, a Greek dictionary is called a lexicon. Other ancient language dictionaries are called lexicons. Lexicon has other meanings. You might refer to a um, the, the lexicon of a whole people, referring to their full set of vocabulary or whatever. But here we're talking about lexicon as a dictionary, specifically a dictionary of biblical Hebrew. And the form in which a Hebrew noun appears therein is its lexical form form. A Hebrew noun is inflected. Remember I told you earlier what to inflect means. It means to change its form um, to represent this combination of characteristics that we're talking about. A Hebrew noun is inflected by adding endings to its lexical form and the result of that is called its inflected form. So you've got a noun's lexical form which is the form in which it appears in the dictionary and then you've got its inflected form, which is how it's used in any given context, reflecting its gender, number, and state. Inflection can affect other changes to lexical form, besides merely adding some characters to the end, like vowel reduction. And so, for example, the word navi is prophet. That vowel under the noon, the comets, has a ah sound. When you make that word plural, it becomes navi'im. So that na sound became n. It, it reduced, it shortened when we made it plural to prophets. Navi versus navi'im. So vowel reduction is one kind of change that inflection often um, results in. Another example is syllabic contraction, the contraction of multiple syllables into just one. So for example, in the noun zayat, which means olive, you've got two syllables, a, i, za, yit. But when you make that plural, the a and e syllables contract to the syllable a, so it becomes zaytim. Zayat means olive, zaytim means olives. So this is just an illustration of some of the kinds of changes that inflecting a noun from one form to another often results in. All right, in the masculine gender, singular nouns do not have distinctive endings. Meaning, um, meaning if you took a hundred nouns out of the Hebrew, a hundred masculine singular nouns out of the dictionary, you picked at random, there won't be any identifiable pattern in its ending. You won't be able to say, oh, 80% of these nouns or whatever all have this same character or syllable at the end of the word. All right, so there's no, in masculine singular nouns, there's not a distinctive ending. But when you inflect it to be dual or plural, there is a distinctive ending. And you're going to be learning that in the course of this lecture. Now, unlike masculine singular nouns, feminine singular nouns do usually have a distinctive ending. So if you pull out 100 female, feminine singular nouns out of a Hebrew lexicon, you will find that most of them do have a distinctive ending, a recognizable ending um, that is recognizably feminine and plural. And the plural and dual always do. So when we're dealing with dual or plural, masculine and feminine nouns always have a, um, a, recognizable, a recognizably plural ending. But masculine singular ones don't, only feminine singulars do. Um, in the dual, Masculine and feminine nouns share the same ending. So um, when you see this particular ending, you'll know that it is dual in form, but you won't be able to tell from, it, from the ending itself whether it is masculine or feminine. Rarely, not so rare as to be something you'll almost never encounter, but rare enough that, um, uh, that it is a little bit unusual. It's something you need to be on the lookout for. A masculine noun will take the feminine plural ending and vice versa. All right, so a word that is masculine in grammatical gender will sometimes have a feminine plural form, and a word that is feminine in uh, grammatical gender will sometimes be masculine plural in form. Only in form, not not grammatically. This is important. So um, as you will learn in future lectures, verbs and the subjects of those verbs have to be the same grammatical gender and number. 
And if you have a masculine noun that is that has a feminine plural form, the verb will still match the masculine gender of the subject because it's still masculine in gender and grammar. It's just it has a it has the feminine the characteristically feminine plural ending. So be on the lookout for that. And 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 also um, I've mentioned a couple of the ways that um, nouns change in pluralization, the way that they change when you inflect it to become plural. Sometimes pluralization involves more significant changes. So just be on the lookout for that as well. One of the things that you'll need to sort of remember as you learn biblical Hebrew, and I would say this is true of most languages, is that there's almost always exceptions to the rule. So just be aware, you're gonna be learning the, you know, the generic rules, um, but always be ready for exceptions. Now this table on the slide right now shows you those endings that I was talking about. So you've got columns for masculine and feminine, and you've got rows for singular, dual, and plural. The masculine singular has no distinctive ending, like I said in the last slide. So just a line there. The feminine singular ending, however, is typically going to be either the, the syllable ah, a, a comets followed by an, an ending hey, or it will end with a tav. And um, there's a variety of different um, vowels that will precede that tav. Uh, and if you want to memorize those, you can. This, this uh, as I've pointed out in previous lectures, this lecture series is based on Basics of Biblical Hebrew, the second edition published by Zondervan, which is authored by Pratico and Van Pelt. And if you want to look at all the various vowel combinations that uh, are characteristically feminine endings, you can do that. Or, and this is just my personal recommendation, just remember that typically feminine singular nouns end in a tav. In the plural, the masculine, the characteristically masculine plural ending is im. That's a hirek followed by a yod, which is, if you'll remember from last lecture, that's the hirek yod uh, mater lectionis, or, or long uh, vowel letter is what your uh, textbook calls it, followed by a, an ending main. So im. You see that word im, and it's uh, a word ending in this combination of vowels and consonants. It'll usually be a masculine plural noun. A feminine plural noun characteristically ends in ot. That's a holum vav, which is again one of those mater, uh, matrix lectionis that we learned last uh, in last lecture, or vowel letters. It's a long o sound, followed by a tav. So that's a characteristically feminine plural ending. And then finally in the dual, um, the form is always the same whether you're dealing with the masculine or feminine. It, feminine. It's ayam. All right. So that's not im, which is the masculine plural. This is ayam. So the, uh, the, the accent is on the second to last syllable, which is not characteristic of Hebrew. That syllable will have a patach, the short a vowel sound. And then it will be followed by a yod and a hirek and a maim. I am. And that's true whether you are dealing with a masculine or feminine. Now, I do have in the feminine column here a slash followed by atayim. That's not because it's technically a different ending. It's just because sometimes a feminine singular, when it's inflected to become dual, in order to make it possible to have an im sound, they will sometimes have to append a toff at the end. And so if they have to append a toff at the end, then they will precede that with a comets, ah, and then end it with tayim. That's a toff with a accent above it and a patach, short a sound beneath it, followed by a yod, a hirek, and a main. So this is the, um, the table if you were going to memorize one set of details this lecture, this is the table you'll want to memorize. The characteristic endings for masculine and feminine, singular, dual, and plural. Here's what this looks like in action. So those endings um, are being applied to the masculine singular word sus and the feminine singular word Torah. Sus means horse, Torah means law or instruction. We'll just say it's law for right now. So notice the uh, masculine singular word sus has no characteristic ending. 
Um, if you pulled out uh, sampling of masculine singular nouns out of a Hebrew lexicon, you will find that the sigma, the, the sorry, the samach ending there, that s sound, is not distinctively masculine singular. Um, when it's made plural, that ending im is added to it. So sus becomes susim. And that dual masculine ending im is, is uh, appended to sus to make dual. So sus in the singular becomes susayim in the plural, or in the dual. So that's the left column. On the right column, you'll notice that the word Torah, Torah, ends in that ah sound, that comets hey ending that is characteristic of most, or many at least, feminine singular nouns. Remember, in that table we just looked at, there, are, there is another very common feminine singular ending, which is a toff, and I could have put another word in this table, probably should have, to show how it would be inflected. But the point is, is that ah is one of the characteristically feminine singular endings, and you see that in the form of the word Torah. To make that feminine plural, now we append that ot ending from the previous slide, and we make it Torot. So Torah is la, Torot is laws. And if there were going to be a dual form, um, the Torah is an example of something where they can't just simply put the ayam dual ending, so they remove the he and instead put atayim at the end, so Torah tayim becomes dual for laws. So this is just a, a, a sample um, illustrating how those endings from the previous slides are appended to the end of the uh, lexical form of singular nouns from the dictionary in order to inflect them to become plural and dual. All right, let's move on now and discuss stems and roots and um, how those play into the kinds of changes that you will see when a noun is inflected from singular to plural and dual. Um, Hebrew is a Semitic language. Semitic comes from the name Shem in um, the, the names of uh, Noah's sons. Um, and Hebrew, like other Semitic languages, has what are called roots. Every Hebrew word, nouns and verbs and adjectives and so forth, theoretically derives from a three consonant root. A Hebrew root expresses some sort of kind of vague general notion. And that vague general notion captured by the root is made more specific by the changes that are made to the root in order to form a word. So for example, here are three words that all share the same root. Um, malach, meaning he reigned or ruled. Melech, meaning king. And mamlacha, meaning kingdom. Now all three of those words have something to do with what it, what it means to reign. Not, not precipitation rain, like water falling from the sky, but reigning as in ruling. They all have something to do with that. One is the verb to do that, to reign. Another is the noun meaning somebody who reigns. And then another one is a noun meaning the, uh, the scope of a person's reign. All right? But all, they all share this root, mem lamech chaf, mem, mem lamech kaf, which has something to do with reigning. So you can see this relationship between the root in Hebrew and the various words that derive from that root. And the three consonants that, compri that comprise any Hebrew root are called the roots radicals. So when you hear the word radical in the context of Hebrew, you're not typically, uh, they're not typically talking about something that's awesome, like totally radical. They're talking about one of these three consonants that makes up a Hebrew word's root. Now it's important that you do not confuse a Hebrew noun's root with what Pratico and Van Pelt in their textbook call the um, noun's stem. That's a confusion that is easily um, suffered from. Uh, but here's a difference. We, we looked at, just in the last slide, we saw that in a Hebrew, in, in, any word that derives from a Hebrew root 
the root are those three consonants that all of the various words that share that general notion all derive from. But the stem of a Hebrew noun, in the way that Pratico and Van Pelt use the word stem, is the combination of consonants in that stem's lexical form. So, for example, the root, as we saw from the previous slide, of mamlacha, which means kingdom, the root are those three radicals mem, lamech, kaf. But the stem of the noun is all five of the consonants in the lexical form of that word, mem, mem, lamech, kaf, and um, he. So you've got the root, which is the three, the three radicals that all words that have to do with reigning derive from. And then there's the stem of the noun kingdom, which are those five consonants in its lexical form. But I want you to remember this very carefully. This is really important. Um, as much as I, Pratical and Van Pelt is a great textbook, but this I think is, um, can be a little bit easily um, overlooked, that the word stem Far, you know, the vast majority of the time that word is used in the context of biblical Hebrew, it's referring to a characteristic of Hebrew verbs, which is something that you will learn later in the series. So just make sure that you distinguish between what Pratico and Van Pelt are talking about when they're talking about a noun's stem versus what the word stem usually refers to in biblical Hebrew, which is a particular quality or characteristic of Hebrew verbs. Just keep that in mind as we move forward. Now, uh, we've talked about the endings that get added to the end of lexical forms in order to make them dual or plural, and that, and that characteristically uh, identify a word as either masculine or feminine. But I also mentioned that there will be additional changes that happen during pluralization. And one such change is a kind of change that the, in which the stem of the noun undergoes changes during pluralization. So, for example, the word ish, aleph, hirak, yod, shin, becomes anashim. Notice that the yod, the second consonant in the stem, aleph, yod, shin, has disappeared and been replaced by the consonant nun. So, in going from ish to anashim, man to men, the stem itself has undergone change. It's not merely the, the appending of the ending im for masculine plural, it's also a change to the stem itself. Similarly, the word woman, isha, becomes nashim. Notice that the aleph at the beginning of isha has been changed to a noon, and one of the two sheens has disappeared. Now you might wonder, wait, I only see one sheen. Well, go back and watch the previous lecture because you'll remember, you'll, you'll, you learned in that previous lecture on the, 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 the <laughs> on the nikudot, the, the marking system, the markings that are used in the system called nikud, that the dagesh uh, forta, um, meaning strong emphasis, doubles the consonant that it is applied to. So you've got, um, sheen here with a dagesh forta in it, meaning it's doubled. So it's, if you were to transliterate it, it would be aleph sheen sheen he. So there actually are two sheens in the word isha, meaning woman, but only one of those is showing up in the form nashim, which is plural. So you can see that the stem in both of these two words undergoes additional changes uh, when it's made plural. And by the way, you'll also notice that they both have characteristically masculine plural endings. So, and we'll talk about that as we move forward. Because the stem is one of the things that is uh, possible to change when a noun undergoes pluralization, for that reason, it's helpful to practice both the singular and plural forms when you're memorizing vocabulary. So I am going to recommend that on your flashcards, you have both the singular and plural form of the noun, because that will help you to be able to more easily identify plural nouns where the changes are much more extensive than just an appending of, a, of an ending. Much more commonly, however, it's not the stem that undergoes changes, it's the vowels. In fact, in those examples we just looked at, the vowels change too, but the vowels are almost always going to change even if the stem does not. And so that's where we're gonna focus on most of our time now. Some nouns pluralize with no change. The word um, shir, shir, 
meaning song, becomes shirim. And you'll notice that the hirek yod, the only vowel in the word shir, is still there in the plural. And then the ending im is tacked onto the end. So that didn't undergo any change. Similarly, the word ot, meaning sign, it's got one vowel in it, which is that holam vav, the vav with a dot on top. That, become, that word, when it's pluralized, becomes otot. And notice that holam vav is still there. And then the ot ending for feminine plural is added. So here are a couple of examples of words where not the, the stem doesn't undergo any changes and neither do the vowels. But usually pluralization does cause changes, such as the reduction of vowels or the disappearance of vowels or the contraction of syllables. And we're going to be going through the various kinds of changes uh, that you will encounter along these lines. Here's the one of the most common um, such changes to vowels. In a noun in which the second of the two syllables is accented, pluralization often reduces the first vowel to a shava. So for example, the word davar means word or thing or matter. And you'll notice it's two syllables, da and var, and the accent is on the second of the two. So davar, sorry, davar, right? Davar. When it is um, pluralized, the vowel, the first vowel becomes a shava. So the word becomes davarim, words. Um, similarly, in the word anan, meaning cloud, the comets under the ayin becomes a shava in pluralization. So anan becomes ananim. But notice that ayin is a guttural. So the kind of shava that appears under it is not an ordinary shava. It's a composite shava, um, also known as a reduced, uh, a reduced vowel is what the textbook that we're going through calls it. So this is a very common change, uh, probably the most recognizable change, um, as far as I can tell, when going from singular to plural in Biblical Hebrew. Now, the reduced vowel, uh, after it's been pluralized, um, which was originally in the pre-tonic syllable, and, and for that you're going to need to go back to, uh, I think it was last lecture, where we talked about the tonic syllable is the accented one, the pre-tonic syllable is the pre-tonic syllable, and the syllable before that is called pro-pre-tonic. And in um, these cases where that first vowel is shortened or reduced to a shava, it, the vowel that was shortened was originally in the pre-tonic syllable, right? So in davar, var is the tonic and da is the pre-tonic. But when you add the ending, you're adding another syllable and the syllable becomes the, 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 the last symbol, syllable becomes the tonic syllable, the one that receives the accent. So now what was originally the pre-tonic syllable is now called the pro-pre-tonic syllable. Right? So, da in davar was pretonic, but in davarim, it's pro-pretonic because we've added another syllable at the end that has the emphasis. All right? So, what was pretonic is now pro-pretonic, and the vowel there has been reduced to a shava. And for that reason, this particular kind of change is called pro-pretonic reduction. It just means the vowel that is now in the pro-pretonic syllable is reduced. So that's one kind of change you will need to be on the lookout for, the reduction of what becomes the pro-pretonic syllable from whatever vowel it was originally to a shava. Now in a noun whose second of two syllables is accented, which is the same kind we've been talking about, davar, anan, sometimes or occasionally pluralization reduces the second vowel instead of the first. So, it, you know, we looked at, in the last slide, we looked at how in davar, um, the da becomes d in pluralization, davarim. So the first syllable was reduced, the propritonic one, the resultingly propritonic one. But in other cases, occasionally, it's not the first vowel that is reduced, it's the second. So in the noun shofate, meaning judge, 
You might have expected, if all you knew was the previous slide, you might have expected this to become something like Shafei team or something like that, but that's not how it works. In this word, it's the second vowel, that tsere, that is reduced. So the sho is still there, the sheen and the holem, but the fe becomes f. So it's uh, shofatim. And actually, because holem by itself is a short vowel, right? It's, it's long if it's a holem vav, but without the vav, if it's just a holem, it's a short vowel. And if you'll remember, shavaz after short vowels are typically silent. So you would pronounce this shoftim. And in the case of the word moed, again, if all you had seen was the previous slide, you might have expected that this noun, meaning assembly, when it's made plural, would become something like meedim. But this isn't, it's not the propretonic syllable in, in the plural form that is, that experiences a reduction. It's the, it's the second syllable. So instead of a tsere under the ayin, that um, becomes a shava, but because ayin is a guttural, you can't have a shava right under it, and so instead of a regular shava, it's a composite shava. And composite shavas, as you'll recall from last lecture, are always pronounced, unlike shavas by themselves, which are sometimes silent. So the word moed, um, or when it's made plural, the mo remains there, it, unchanged. But the tsere is reduced to a composite shava, a chataf patach, which becomes moadim. Mo adim. Notice the hurried nature of that ah sound. Mo adim. All right. Now, um, when uh, the it, it, when the syllable uh, that is pre-tonic after pluralization um, is a comet, then it's not reduced. In the cases that we just looked at, the vowel in what becomes the pre-tonic syllable was originally a tsere, and that is reduced. But if it had been a, a comet, it would not be re reduced, all right? So just keep that in mind. Now, sometimes two syllables in a singular noun are contracted and become one syllable in pluralization. We already looked at one of those examples earlier. The noun zayat, meaning olive, becomes zaytim. So notice those two syllables, za and yi, become the single syllable, zay. So the, uh, the, the uh, patach and the yod with the hirak under it combine or contract to become the, the single uh, vowel, tsegre yod. So zayat becomes zaytim. A similar uh, kind of contraction is in the word mavet. Mavet is the word meaning death, and when it is pluralized, the two syllables ma and ve are contracted to become mo. So the comets followed by the vav with a segol under it, that all contracts to simply a um, holum vav. The, the mater lectionis or vowel letter known as holum vav, a vav with a dot on top. So mavet becomes motim. Um, one other kind of change that is somewhat common is that if a noun ends with segol he, um, that segol he will disappear entirely during pluralization. So in the noun jose, the, um, the the segol he disappears entirely, and then the im ending is tacked onto it. So jose becomes chozim. And roe, meaning shepherd, similarly becomes roim. The segol he ending just drops out entirely. So these are the kind, some of the changes that you're going to need to be familiar with. Now, um, there's are, there are particular categories or classifications of nouns based on the roots that they come from. One such category of noun or classification of noun is called geminate nouns. And these are nouns that come from roots whose second and third radicals are identical. And that's where the word geminate comes from. The Latin gemini means twins. So geminate nouns are like twin nouns in the sense that the second and third radical in the root that it derives from are the same. 
Now, usually in uh, geminate nouns, only one of the two identical radicals in the root appears in the noun singular form. So I mentioned the word am earlier, a people. That's two consonants, ayin and main, but it comes from a root that has three radicals, ayin, main, main. Notice the two mains, the second and third radicals in the root are both main. But when it is actually made into a word, am, um, one of those two radicals uh, vanishes, disappears. When possible, um, a pluralized geminate noun's other identical radical reappears in the plural form by means of a dagesh forta. So am, um, where only one of the two mames in the rat in the in the root shows up, when it becomes plural, it becomes amim, and there's a dagesh forta in the mame, which which represents doubling. So it, there, there is technically two mames there. It's just, it's a one mame doubled by means of a dogish forta. So this is another kind of change you will, you will encounter when nouns are pluralized. You might encounter the introduction of a dogish forta because the doubled, the, the doubled um, radicals in the root resurface, even though it was hidden in the singular form. The reason, in case you're curious, why the dagesh forta isn't used in the singular to double the radical is because in biblical Hebrew, it's, it's, uh, biblical Hebrew doesn't like words to end with a dagesh forta. Okay, so just remember that um, if you see, uh, you know, just remember that these plural, that this is one of those kinds of changes that a, that a noun will undergo when becoming, when being pluralized, uh, a, a identical radical will resurface in the form of a dogish forta. Now, some geminate nouns, that is some nouns that derive from geminate roots, some of them have additional prefixes, in which case the second of the roots identical radicals is represented by a dogish forta, um, even in the singular. So for example, the word masila uh, comes from the root samech lamed lamed. And you'll see that that dagesh forta in the um, lamed doubles the lamed. So you can see that the second radical is there because the prefix meme was prefixed to the beginning of the word. And very similarly in the word tefila, the root is pe lamed lamed. The prefix is the prefix taf is added at the beginning, and the second of those two lameds is represented by a dagesh forta in the noun. Now the reason to be aware of this is because when geminates that have prefixes like this are pluralized, the other rules that we've already looked at are usually they usually apply in a very straightforward way. So masila in the singular, which means a highway, becomes masilot. There's that ot, feminine plural ending, meaning, so, so this becomes highways. And you'll notice that, that uh, the original form of the word is only changed in that the a, ah, feminine ending, is replaced with the ot, plural ending. In both the singular and the plural, the second of the two lamids in the root is represented by the dagesh forte. Pluralization of geminates without prefixes can be a little bit more difficult because they will often exhibit additional changes besides just the um, dagesh forta causing the um, second of the identical radicals in the root to resurface. Beyond that, there are some additional changes that pluralization of geminates causes. If a geminate's second radical can't take the dagesh forta because it's a guttural or, or, or resh, the initial vowel often lengthens in a change called compensatory lengthening. Um, this just means that the vowel preceding what would have been the dagesh forta is lengthened in order to compensate for the fact that the dagesh forta can't go there. So take the noun sar, meaning a prince. Um, the, the letter reish is, is not technically a guttural, but like gutturals, it cannot take a dagesh forta. 
And so when this geminate is made plural, sarim, something has to compensate for the loss or for, for the fact that the dagesh can't make the reish doubled. And the, what, the compensation is made in the form of the lengthening of the patach in sar to a kametz, sarim. So that's compensatory lengthening, the lengthening of the vowel to compensate for something that was expected but couldn't happen. Now, if a geminate's initial vowel is tsere or holem, and the second radical can take the dagesh, then the initial vowel shortens. So take the word chetz, meaning arrow. Um, when this is pluralized, the um, tsari at the end of chetz can take, te, can take the dagesh forte, indicating that the root actually has two tsaris. And so that tsere is, is uh, shortened to a simple hirek. So chetz becomes chitzim. And similarly, the word dov, meaning bear, that bait can take a dagesh forta, which it does in the plural to indicate that the root actually has two baits and not just one. And so that holum is shortened to a shurek, sorry, not a shurek, a kibbutz. So dov, singular bear, becomes dobim. Notice I said not dovim, but dobim, and that's because when a bagad kafat consonant, and you will have learned this in lecture one, um, a, bagad kaf, a, bag, a bagad kafat consonant like bait, when it has a dagesh in it, um, is not only doubled, it's also, um, it's also hardened. Okay, so the v sound becomes a b sound. So dov becomes dubim. All right. Now another category or classification of noun is called segalit. Segalit. And the and segalit nouns are nouns that have two syllables, the first of which is accented. The reason that these are called segalits is because they typically feature segals, either in both syllables or in one or the other. I say typically because there are some exceptions where, where they are in fact segalit because they're two syllables and the first of them is accented, but which actually don't have any segals. So just be aware this is a, a generalization that they feature segals. So examples of these are melech. Notice it's not melech. It's melech. And in both syllables uh, feature segals. Similarly, boker is also segalit because it's got two syllables, but it's not boker, it's boker. Uh, but in this case, only the second of the two syllables features a segol. That word means morning, by the way. And the word zega, zera, means, meaning seed, also has two syllables, and it's also zera, not zera, right? So it's the first of two, of its two syllables is accented, makes it segalit, even though only the first of the two syllables features a segol. And as I said, some segolits actually don't have any segol at all. So the rule here for a segolit noun is its lexical form is two syllables, the first of which is accented. And in the plural, segolits all share the same vowel pattern. Um, a, a vocal shiva, followed by a comet, followed by the ending, whether that's im or ot, im for masculine or ot for feminine. And if that shiva is under a guttural, then it will be a composite shiva. So, for example, melech becomes malachim. And cherev becomes chravot. So, just remember those patterns, masculine a'im and a'ot. And that'll help you to remember. In fact, that's that's a very, very, very common um, form, uh, vowel pattern for plural nouns, uh, uh, im and uh, uh, ot. Okay. Now, we looked earlier at what it means to parse an English noun. Here's what it looks like to parse a Hebrew noun. When asked to parse a Hebrew noun, you're going to want to provide its gender, its number, its state, and its lexical form. You might also add its meaning, but for the sake of, that's not technically part of parsing. So for example, in the word melech, 
um, we can see there's no characteristic ending at the end. There's not an ah, there's not a taf, there's not an im, there's not an ot, there's not an ayim. And just from vocabulary, we know that melech means king and is masculine, so that's its gender. We know it's singular, that's its number. And as we've said, all of this lecture is dealing with absolute state, so its state is absolute, and the lexical form is its inflected form here, melech. In the word banot, we'll immediately recognize that characteristic feminine plural ending ot. And sure enough, this is feminine gender and plural number. And again, we're dealing only with the absolute state here. And the lexical form is bat, meaning daughter. One last example is yomayim. And that ayim ending is characteristically dual. Um, so in this case, you can't tell merely from yomayim whether it's masculine or feminine. That's just something you'll know by vocabulary memorization. Um, that this is a masculine and dual. And again, we're only dealing with absolute state. And it's from the lexical form yom, meaning day. So in that opening chapter of Genesis, that majestic section with the uh, there was first day, there was second day, etc. Yom is the word for day there. So this is what it means to parse a Hebrew noun. And when you're asked in your assignments to parse Hebrew nouns, this is the information that you're being asked for. All right, so that was a lot of material, um, but uh, hopefully this is something that you'll go back and watch a few times if need be. Um, but it's, uh, it's a lot of information representing some real key uh, issues, which are those endings that you need to memorize and then just be familiar with the kinds of changes that nouns undergo when um, being pluralized. That's the gist of this lesson. Um, so go back and watch this for reference in the future if need be. But at this point now, let's turn to the vocabulary that your textbook, B Basics of Biblical Hebrew, second edition, has um, at the end of the chapter that this lecture corresponds to, which is chapter four. We're gonna go through those vocabulary, uh, those vocabulary words now. Firstly is the word Adonai, Adonai. This means Lord, as in the Lord. Um, technically, it's another word, Adon, which we've got right here, but it's got an ending at the end of it to make it my. So technically, I, I believe this is my Lord. Um, and an example of a place where this is used is in Psalm 109.21, the Ata Adonai Adonai. And the reason why I said Adonai twice is because the name of God, Jehovah or Yahweh, when we read Biblical Hebrew, is typically instead pronounced Adonai. Um, and Adonai here means my Lord. But you, O oh God, my Lord, is what this Hebrew represents. All right. Adon is the form from which Adonai comes. So this is not my Lord, but just Lord or master. It's a word that is used even to refer to somebody's ruler, somebody's king. It's not restricted to only God. In fact, in Deuteronomy 10, 17, the God is called God of gods and Lord of lords. Lord of lords is Adonai Ha Adon, uh, Adonin, Lord of lords, meaning of all the lords out there, of all the masters and rulers, God is the Lord of them all. Next vocabulary word is Ach, which means brother. Uh, in Genesis 24, 29, um, we are told, U Lagrivka Ach. Rebecca had a brother. And this is a word that has an irregular plural form. Remember, this is one of those exceptions to the rule that we talked about earlier. So because ach is masculine, you might have expected um, that... Oh, sorry. The reason why this is irregular is because the comets has been reduced to a patach. That's why this is considered an irregular plural, but you wouldn't have, um, you probably wouldn't have even noticed because that ending, hirek yod meim, is just tacked on to the end. It's just that the comets under the aleph gets shortened to a patach. So ach, meaning brother, achim, meaning brothers. Next up is ish, meaning man or husband. So this isn't a person in general, regardless of what gender, this is specifically a male adult person, a man, a husband. 
So, for example, Genesis 3, 6 uh, says, Noah ish tzada, uh, tzaddik. Noah was a righteous man. And here again, we have an irregular plural. This is a stem change. So, ish becomes anashim. Next up is isha, meaning woman or wife. Again, this is not a person in general. This is a female adult person, a woman or a wife. Genesis 2.23 says, Lazot yikare isha. Again, that's Lazot yikare isha. She shall be called woman. And here we have an irregular plural, both in that it's a stem change and the ending is masculine in form, even though it's a feminine uh, grammatically. So isha becomes nashim. So these two are going to take some, you're going to have to get used to the fact that ish and isha sound very similar, both in the singular and plural. Uh, and both appear masculine in the plural form, even though they are not. One of them is masculine, one of them is feminine. So just make sure you're careful with these two words. Next up is bat, and this means daughter. In Genesis 19.8, the person says, Hine na li shete banot. Behold, I have two daughters. Literally, there are two daughters to me. Or to me, there are two daughters. And this again is an irregular plural in that the taf is uh, dis disappears and the en and a noon takes its place and then the ending ot is added, and then of course the patach is lengthened to a comment. So bat becomes banot in the plural. Next up is goy, and this means nation or people. It's also the word used to describe a gentile, a non-Jew. In Genesis 10.32, we are told, Ume ele nif redu hagoyim. From these spread out the nations. From these the nations spread. All right? Not, this is a regular plural, goyim. Uh, yep, goyim. Okay, next up is derech. Derech. Or derek. If you're going to say it very Americanized. Derech. And this means a road or a way or a journey. Jeremiah 21, 8 says, Et derech hachayim, et derech hamavet. The way of life and the way of death. And this is one of those words that is both masculine and feminine. Or you might say it's neutral. Next up is har. Har. Meaning hill or mountain or hill country. Genesis 8 5 says, Nir u ra, um, ra she ha, he harim. Again, that's Nir u ra she he harim. The tops of the mountains were seen. Next up is Kohain. This is also in many. Um, uh, Jewish people's last name uh, is uh, Cohen, and that's what this is, but it's Kohain, and it means priest. So in Genesis 14, 18, um, Melchizedek uh, is called priest of the God of God Most High. We're told, Vahu Kohain Le'el uh, Elyon. He was priest of God Most High. Next up is Lave meaning heart and literally it's the the heart organ but metaphorically it's it's the mind it's the person's will the seat of a person's character and emotions and so forth um genesis 8 21 says yetzer lev ha adam ra the intention of a man's heart is evil and the there is an alternative form of this segalit or sorry geminate geminate noun uh, instead of lave, it sometimes appears as levav. Next up is mayim. Mayim. This means water. So in Genesis one six, we read of uh, we read of rakia betoch hamayim. We read of an expanse in the midst of the waters. And this word is dual in form only. 
There is no singular word for a water. You just have the collective noun waters, which is dual in form and refers to some sort of body or, excuse me, body or container of water, contained amount of water. Next is nefesh. Nefesh. This has a variety of meanings. Historically, it has been translated as soul. Um, more often, it seems to me, it means life or person. It can sometimes refer to a person's neck or throat. In Exodus 21, 23, we see, or we read, Venatata nefesh tachat nefesh, which means, then you shall pay life in exchange for life. And this is a word that, although it doesn't have a characteristically feminine ending, is in fact feminine. So the, the, uh, the plural form will be nefashot. It'll have that feminine plural ending. Next up is navi, which means prophet. Navi. Deuteronomy 18.20 reads, Umate hanavi hahu. That same prophet shall die. Navi. Next up is Sefer. Sefer. This means book or scroll or document. Exodus 17.14 reads, Ketov zot zikaron ba Sefer. Write this as a memorial in a book. Sefer. Next up is Ayan. Ayan. And this means eye, like this kind of eye, the kind of eye in your head, or spring, like this uh, spring from which a water flows. Um, Genesis 3, 6 reads, Ta'ava hu la'enayim, which means it was a delight to the eyes. And this is a word that is feminine, and it's um, it doesn't have a plural form. There, it's, it's, it's not a plural thing. It's a dual thing. It naturally comes in pairs. So um, you would not have the plural form of ayin. You will have the dual form, a nayim. A nayim. And notice that's an irregular dual, right? It's, it's not just an ayim ending added to the end of ayin. Ayin actually undergoes some changes before the plural ending is added. Ayin, a nayim. Ear. Kind of like the English word ear, right? Ear, meaning city or town. So in Genesis 11.4, people say, Hava nivne lanu, or lanu, ear. Hava niv, uh, nivne lanu, ear. Come, let us build for ourselves a city. This is again a feminine word, even though it doesn't have the characteristic feminine singular ending. And in the plural, it's irregular. It's arim. So it's uh, irregular in two ways. Not only does it have the masculine form plural ending, but it also, instead of the, the, the hirak yod, is replaced with a kametz in the plural form. So ir is one city, arim is more than one city. Tzava, all right, so this is the word that we learned toward the beginning of this lecture, meaning host or army, war, service. Exodus 12, 41 speaks of kol tzivot Adonai, all the hosts or armies of the Lord. Again, this is feminine, even though it doesn't have a characteristically feminine singular ending. And when it is plural, it appears as tzvaot. Kol. Kol. This means voice or sound or noise. So in Genesis 3, 8, Adam and Eve hear the sound of the Lord God walking. Um, that text says, Vayishm'u et kol Adonai Elohim. They heard the sound of the Lord God. Rosh. Like Roche, but in, in not so Americanized. Roche, Roche. This means head, top, or chief. 
Uh, it's where we get Rosh Hashanah, meaning first of the year. Rosh, Rosh. <laughs> I'm still working on my R's, my Rosh's. Genesis 48, 14, it reads, Vayase al Rosh Ephraim, and laid it on the head of Ephraim. Torah, 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 Torah. This is law or instruction, teaching or custom. It's also the word that is used to refer to the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, it's also the Mosaic law in total is referred to as Torah. Also, Jewish people often refer to their whole Hebrew Bible as Torah. Um, so it's a very flexible word. And in Exodus 12, 40, 1249, we read Torah achat uh, yihyeh la ezra. There shall be one law for the native. And that's it. That's all the vocabulary. So let's wrap up our lecture today by talking about some um, ways that you, or some recommendations for how to um, study your vocabulary flashcards. We talked about some of them last lecture. So you'll uh, remember I suggested that you create and practice vocabulary flashcards. I, in that lecture, gave you a link to my Quizlet flashcards that I created for that lecture. Um, I've done the same thing this time. So if you go to the link on your screen, you can practice the flashcards I've put together for this lecture. And I suggested last lecture that you frequently shuffle your physical flashcards or randomize your digital ones. Uh, sometimes your software will call it shuffling them. But the point is, don't be, become dependent upon memorizing them in a certain order. You want to be able to remember, recognize them regardless of what came before or comes after them. And then I also recommended that you practice both from Hebrew to English and from English to Hebrew. That's going to help reinforce uh, the, the connection of meanings in your mind. But this week I want to add an additional one or two suggestions. Firstly, I, as I mentioned earlier, you want to include both the singular and plural form of the Hebrew word on the Hebrew side of your flashcards. And this is because, as we talked about, a lot of nouns undergo um, significant changes in pluralization. And it'll be helpful for you if you can recognize both forms, um, even if they're significantly different. So that's the first additional piece of advice I want to give you in this lecture. And the second one is, after mastering the vocab in one lecture, I'd encourage you to mix the set in with your previous sets and practice them together. So by now, hopefully you've mastered Lecture 2's vocabulary, um, which were the vocabulary words at the end of Chapter 3 in Pratical and Van Pelt's Basics of Biblical Hebrew, 2nd Edition. After you have um, gotten a good handle on this lecture's vocabulary, which is the vocabulary at the end of chapter four, I'm encouraging you to mix those together and then practice them all together. And if you do that, then you're, it's, it's, because it's just going to reinforce in your mind the meanings of these words because they will, know, they will lose their whatever connections you started to have between um, words in a word in one set and the other words in that set, right? You don't want to become so dependent on tzava being within the same group of words with ach, right? You want to be able, which were two words in this vocabulary that we just went through. You want to be able to recognize those even if they come before or after words from the previous lecture and words from future lectures. So ideally, you're going to be growing you know, a larger and larger and larger, larger vocabulary set that are all mixed together so that you're not dependent upon them being segregated by lecture. All right. So that's the last bit of advice that I want to give you there. Now, secondly, this is now a good time for you to start learning how to type in Hebrew so that you can create your own Hebrew vocabulary flashcards. 
Um, this, if you do that, if you start learning how to type and if you start creating your vocabulary flashcards by typing them out yourself, it's going to make it easier for you to, um, uh, to, to remember the vocabulary and the language, but it's also going to make it easier for you in the future to include Hebrew in papers that you write if you're in seminary or, or some other educational context. It's going to help you to put Hebrew in social media and all sorts of places like that. So typing Hebrew in this day and age would be uh, very beneficial for you to learn. To get started, you can go to a resource, uh, just a real simple website, uh, web page at the website of Reformed Theological Seminary. And I've got a shortened URL up on the screen for you to go to, and that will talk you uh, through how to get started typing in Hebrew, whether you're on a Mac computer or a PC, a Windows computer. That's, that's how you can get started, but if you want something a little more detailed, like a detailed tutorial on how to type in Hebrew, I'm going to record a video explaining just that, and I'll include it in this series very soon. By the time I've uploaded this, I still will not have produced the, the typing video, but I will have it soon. So if you're watching this and it's not available yet, just hang in there. You can get started if you want by going to that link on the screen, but be keeping your eyes very soon. Keep your eyes in on this channel for the, another entry in this series coming up very soon on how to type biblical Hebrew. Um, and now I want to give you the same advice I gave you last lecture. I want to encourage you to practice reading pointed Hebrew aloud, even if you don't understand what you're saying. When, remember, I was going back, to, when we were just doing the vocabulary and I was reading the Hebrew on the screen uh, for the example sentences in which the vocabulary appears, you can tell I'm still stumbling and struggling. Um, I'm trying to do better and better and better at that. And the only way that you get better and better and better at being able to read aloud uh, or, or just read period, biblical Hebrew, is by practicing. So even if you don't understand what it is that you're saying aloud, practice reading pointed Hebrew aloud. And one way that you can do that is by following along in the pointed Hebrew as a fluent reader, unlike me, reads it aloud. So I've given here a couple of links to YouTube videos where you can alter the speed so you can slow it down a bit um, to make it easier to follow along. And in these videos that I've linked to, um, they're, they highlight the words as they're vocalizing them so that you can more easily follow along. So that's it. I hope this has been helpful and gives you a good grasp of Hebrew nouns. Um, and we'll be back uh, in the next episode in the series for either that video on typing in Hebrew or at the very least the video that will give you a chance to practice what you've learned in this lecture just like I did in videos after the second and first lectures as well. After this lecture, the next one will be a lecture that teaches you the definite article meaning the and the conjunction meaning and. But until then, toda raba. Thanks a lot. I've been your host, Chris Date, and thanks so much for watching The Apologetics, where we think together through what we believe, why we believe it, and not something else. If you've enjoyed this episode, please click the thumbs up, like icon, the subscribe button, and the bell icon to receive notifications when new videos are streamed or uploaded. Either way, come back in two weeks for the next episode of The Apologetics, streaming live on YouTube every other Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific. Until then... <laughs>